So yesterday I canceled my private pilot helicopter check ride. I was supposed to take that on August 30th and discontinued my helicopter flight training. So today let's talk about what happened and why uh, I won't be getting my uh, helicopter private uh, add-on. What's up everybody, it's Mover. Um, wish I didn't have to make this video today. I actually started, uh, I was gonna do a Mover mailbag, but I got to one of the uh, first things that was helicopter related. And before I go uh, any uh, further, I decided it's time to talk about what happened. And like the title suggested, this is not clickbait. This really did happen. Uh, I am no longer uh, in helicopter flight training and uh, I canceled my check ride, so. To start off, uh, this is 100% on me. Uh, I don't blame anyone else for what has happened. I take full responsibility because no matter what happened, the ultimate responsibility for my training is me. It doesn't matter what the external circumstances are. It doesn't matter uh, what happened. It was on me uh, to make sure my training was accomplished uh, in a timely manner and successfully. So. Um, what I would caution people is from, you know, getting angry at other parties or taking sides or, or whatever. So I'm going to change some of the names uh, in the story just to prevent any, you know, anybody getting angry or anything like that. But uh, there are some parts that I'm going to talk about in the most factual way that I can, because I think it's important to add uh, all the other information, amplifying data. So uh, let's get started with the probably the biggest um, update. So. Uh, as you remember from the last vlog, I did not think I was going to make uh, a helicopter flight training vlog this week because you guys were caught up uh, with my training based on the airspeed indicator stuff and me going and flying T-38s. And last week I was out uh, at Eglin flying the T-38, so didn't think, um, you know, I wasn't sure. But Lester and I actually were scheduled to fly my, um, or he was going to come out with me. I was going to do my one hour of night solo uh, on Sunday. While I was at Eglin, I got a phone call. Uh, Lester was involved in a small aircraft mishap, um, so I was very worried about him. Uh, just to put that out there right now, he is okay. Uh, he was in very serious condition uh, at the time of the mishap. He spent uh, several days in the hospital and some surgeries and stuff, and if we do a GoFundMe, I'll, I'll let you guys know. But he was uh, injured in the mishap, and um, you know he's now home and recovering. So. I'm very thankful for that. I uh, was very worried about him. But uh, at that time, I had seven hours of solo left and we were gonna do um, a couple. We had already done some of the check ride prep, but we were gonna do like a pre-mock check ride just to make sure I was ready in the check ride, um, you know, the, the, some of the check ride prep prior. What that drove was Lester um, medically, you know, obviously having had some surgeries and stuff is, is not capable of flying with me, at least for the near future, maybe several weeks, maybe several months. So um, that caused us to, to scramble because the check ride was scheduled on August 30th. Uh, and when I say us, there's another student involved. Um, we'll just call him uh, G, who is with uh, a local law enforcement agency that I know and I'm friends with, and they were using Lester to get uh, their uh, PPL done. And we were in contact. We were gonna take our check ride on the same day to save the examiner, you know, the trouble of, of, he was coming out to New Orleans specifically for this. And so he was gonna get two check rides done. They have a much comp more complicated situation, which I won't go into, you know, based on how government agencies work and stuff, but we were trying to find a plan that would work for both of us. So um, after scrambling around a little bit, it's very hard so to speak, to find a qualified certified flight instructor in the local area that is current and qualified on the Robinson R-22. R-44, there are a couple places around, but R-22, um, there's just nobody. I mean, the nearest we could find was Lafayette, which made sense because the examiner was coming from Lafayette, so we were just gonna change a check ride location and do the prep uh, with this guy from Lafayette. Uh, who agreed to do this. So we thought we had a pretty good plan. A couple days prior to the check ride, we were gonna fly the helicopter down to Lafayette and uh, fly with the CFI and um, do our check ride prep, make sure we were good to go, then take the check ride on that Sunday. With that plan in mind, 
Uh, Lester finally got out of the hospital, very thankful uh, about that. You know, he was okay um, and was recovering. I told him, hey, I'm gonna go out to uh, the airport on Wednesday, which was a couple days later, and make sure that, you know, and start my solo because I've got two weeks. And, you know, seven and a half hours is not much in two weeks, but I still have to do a solo cross country at an hour of night and then the check ride prep. So I wanted to get started on that and get back into things. So because I have a PIC endorsement, no problem, um, you know, go fly. I showed up at the airport at 8.30, as I had mentioned, and um, the plan was for me to show up at the FBO, which great bunch of people. Uh, the, the woman who manages uh, that operation at the desk there is good friends with Lester, had coordinated for us to get access to the helicopter and for us to get a ride out there, you know, because we didn't have uh, the gate card or anything because we were just students. So I get out there and I'm going to fly it and they said, uh, I said, hey, can I get a ride? And they're like, well, yeah. And I said, well, can you help me push the helicopter out? And they said, yeah, no problem. They said, but you don't really need to. I'm like, why? Well, because it's already sitting out there. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I walk out on the flight line, which is across the ramp from where the T-hangers are, and the helicopter's sitting there and the blade is starting, the rotor blades are starting to turn. I'm like, that's interesting. So she calls um, the only other person involved, and we're going to call him DJ for the purposes of the story. And I had met, so let's back up. I had met DJ all of two times, and I wasn't impressed. I'll be honest. First time I met him, he had a boot on his foot, and I didn't know really who he was. And I didn't really understand the dynamic of who did what with this whole program and this whole operation because it's part 61 and it's very complicated i just knew the owner of the helicopter uh, was subleasing it or leasing it to someone else and that's really all i understood at that point so i met dj within six seconds six to nine seconds of meeting him i was not very impressed didn't seem uh, all that sharp to me and he was flying with a boot on his foot. He had a broken foot and he was going out and taking passengers to fly around in this uh, R-22 for some other uh, thing. And I was like, that's a little weird. Didn't think much of it. Heard some stories about him. I know he had uh, crashed an R-44 trying to land it on a trailer and uh, nearly took out a Gulf Stream in the process that was parked nearby. And heard some other stories about how he had flown very aggressively, which worried me a little bit because the R-22 has had uh, rotor blade separation issues. They get stress cracks, especially like cattle ranchers and stuff typically find that. And I was worried with a guy like this flying it because you know I didn't want the stress cracks. So I didn't know what his role was, but I didn't really like the idea of him flying it aggressively. I met him a second time. He had a student that was like one or two hours into the program and he was flying with the boot again, which I still thought was weird. And then he kind of vanished and he disappeared because I guess he had something, a surgery or something with the foot and never saw him again. And it wasn't going to be a factor because I was going to be done with my check ride and stuff. When the front desk uh, lady called him, he said, oh, I'm just going to be 20 minutes and I'll be over there. And I'm like, OK, you know, 20, 30 minutes is not a problem. He lands 35 minutes later and tells her I need, you know, eight gallons of fuel each side. And she's like, well, aren't you going to let, you know, Lester's student who had scheduled to fly, fly the helicopter? And he's like, yeah, when I'm done, he was very rude and wouldn't even make eye contact with me. So um, I was a little weirded out by that, I guess. And I, she said, well, well when are you going to be done? And, and uh, he goes, I don't know. And then so I ask, I go, so how long are you planning on using this helicopter? When can I use it? And he goes, soon. And I get a little aggravated at this point. So I go, what is soon? And he said, two hours. I said, well, I'm not waiting around for that. So I called Lester, didn't really want to bother him because he's obviously recovering and all this stuff. And uh, the owner of the helicopter, I guess she called the owner of the helicopter and was trying to, he didn't want to get involved, which rightfully so. Lester said, I'll, I'll, I'll see about it and get back to you. So later on, and Lester knew our plan of, of going to Lafayette and flying with this other instructor. And later on, he calls me and he says, hey, man, I hate to tell you this, but if you want to complete your check, your stuff now to get it over with, uh, you have to fly with this um, uh, DJ. And I said, absolutely not. Cause you know, after that interaction, after hearing about all his stuff, I heard other uh, stories about how aggressive he flew and, you know, unsafe. And I just, I was getting to the point where I wasn't even comfortable getting in the helicopter because I didn't want to fly it after this guy because I didn't trust anything. I later found out that the dynamic 
in place. And again, we're not we're not blaming people. I'm not going to blame Lester or anything like that because I you know I, I don't I think he did what he could. Um, the helicopter was leased to DJ, who subleased it to Lester, and so everything was done under DJ's insurance, uh, his CFI insurance and all the maintenance was done. And remember maintenance, we were talking about airspeed indicators and how we couldn't get it fixed. Well, so um, he would not allow, after Lester talked to him, he would not allow the CFI in Lafayette to fly the helicopter because he didn't want to put him on the insurance, which I understand, it's probably expensive and it was, I knew it was gonna be an uphill battle. Wouldn't allow that to happen, so basically it was either fly with DJ or not. And after my interaction with him that morning and you know, the fighter pilot in me says, you know, let's push forward, let's get it done, I can accept the risk. But, you know, the safety officer in OPSO that I've been in previous life in the military says, when things get too complicated at this point, it's time to step back and it's time to reevaluate. And after everything that we have been through from uh, the annual stuff, the airspeed indicator, and now this, I thought it was just time to, to stop. So the other piece to that puzzle too, um, the helicopter, Robinson helicopters have about a 2200 hour, uh, 12 year life before they have to go through a major overhaul and it's a drop dead time. And so that helicopter was getting close to timing out. Um, with myself and the other student, there was only about 20 or 30 hours of slop and um, DJ had been flying with the student and flying by himself for several days prior to that. Uh, prior to my interaction with him, which means that, you know, they were burning time off that. So I was getting very close. It was about to be a position where we might even time out before I even finished. So um, there's a point where, you know, you're doing this for recreation, you're doing this for a hobby, you're doing this for fun, um, and it's just time to stop. And there, are, unfortunately, there are no other Robinson 22 options in the area. There are no other small helicopter options in the area. The nearest, um, the next door flight school that's got an R44 offered it to me, and then there's another flight school in Baton Rouge that offered their R44 to finish. But with the amount of time it takes to get qualified in the R44 and then add, that would add another three to $5,000 to the cost on top of what I was already gonna do. I mean, it was, so I had 10 hours left in the R44 and then add another three to $5,000 on top of that, which meant you know almost $10,000 just to finish. And that just isn't something I'm willing to do right now. So uh, that's what happened. Uh, I do not blame, uh, I can't stress this enough. I, Lester tried his best. Lester was a good instructor. I enjoyed flying with him. I'm still his friend. I'm still worried about him if his, you know, if he decides to, his family decides to do a GoFundMe to help with medical costs, I will absolutely put that on the channel here. And I hope we will all support him because uh, Lester is a great instructor, but he, it's not his school and it's not his operation. So he's kind of hamstrung and it's the only one within a 200 mile radius. And that's the problem is there's no other options. And so this, it just, we've reached the limit. So what's next? Um, when the airspeed indicator stuff happened, I started looking at other options because I didn't know if that was going to get resolved um, and I didn't want to keep pushing the issue. So um, I contacted some schools in Texas, which lot not ideal because, you know, I have to go there and be gone and I hate being away from the dogs and I hate, you know, having to go back and forth now between Eglin and this. Luckily, I'm still on a leave of absence from the airline so I can still do it, but it's still a lot of being gone. But uh, that's the option now. And so I found a school in Texas, probably going to start in October. I'm going to use the GI Bill. And so people have asked about the GI Bill. And the reason I haven't used the GI Bill yet is because it has to be a Part 141 school and it has to be your commercial pilot add-on. It cannot be your private pilot. So I couldn't use the GI Bill for what I was doing. And there's no schools anywhere around here that use it. But now the new plan is I'm going to use the GI Bill uh, go to a school in Texas and I'm going to it's basically start from scratch 35 hours which it's not really starting from scratch because I will have already had all that experience you know 22 hours behind me 23 hours behind me so I'll already have that experience I can already solo a helicopter I can already fly it fairly well it will be a break I'm going to start in October so it might be you know six weeks off which I'm going to use the pro flight trainer DCS X-Plane um, to try to stay current, try to keep my skills up.
but I'm going to start and I'm going to go straight to a commercial pilot uh, add on and hopefully it'll take you know, between two and three weeks uh, in Texas to get it done. And now I'll walk away with a commercial pilot license in an operation that I can actually trust with a maintenance program that I can hopefully actually trust and a situation where I as a customer am treated fairly. And again, this is not Lester. This is the circumstances around Lester. So, uh, I hope that this all makes sense. I'm going to, you know, when I'm done, I'm, I'm going to fly with Lester some more. You know, I want to bring him back on the channel. He's been a lot of fun. Uh, he, he's a great guy. Uh, he was a good sport when the shirts and stuff. He was, he's a good person. Uh, I just think that, you know, he's kind of a, a victim of this, this situation and not having the ability to start his own. So he's kind of at the mercy of other people. So, um, it just sucks. And I'm hoping he has a speedy recovery and gets back to flying soon because obviously having had the mishap, you know, it's going to take some time for him to recover and stuff. Thankfully he is back, uh, walking a little bit and he's back at home recovering. So those are all very good things. And we're very fortunate that it wasn't much worse. So, uh, anyway, so that's the end of that. Um, he, I'm going to move on to do the ma mover mailbag in another video here, but uh, I just wanted to update you on why there won't be any more Hilo vlogs uh, in the near future. Maybe ever. I don't know. It depends on what the new school's policies are and, and kind of what we agree to uh, moving forward. But um, I'll at least update you on the progress as it goes along. And there may be a, a time in October where there aren't any vlogs coming from the channel because I'll be away and it's very hard to edit and create videos when I'm gone. Um, just don't have the bandwidth in hotels and don't have the processing power on my laptop. So anyway, um, that's it. Um, hope that explains it. Uh, I hope, uh, again, no hard feelings for anybody involved, even DJ, uh, even, you know, the, the people involved, I understand it's business and they think they're doing the right thing. And I think I'm doing the right thing. And, you know, it's, it's my prerogative to walk away at this point. So thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for watching all the Hello Hilo vlogs. It was a lot of fun making them. Uh, hopefully we can do more aviation stuff in the future. Obviously this is not the end of the channel. It's just the end of the Hilo stuff. I will still have DCS videos and um, mover mailbag coming up here uh, in a day or so. And then uh, I'm going to do a thing about the uh, AI versus human DARPA experiment that happened uh, yesterday. So anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Oh! I've a lot of them. Oh, my God. with the doors off. All Fox T. Don't be a douche. Rule number one. Make them tell you now.